And the first is that uh, this meeting will be recorded. In fact, I just started recording. Um, and that in the hopes that we'll be able to share it later for people who are unable to attend. A uh, couple of other things you'll notice. This is a Zoom webinar format. That's a little bit different from Zoom meetings that you may be familiar with. So um, the way this works is only certain people uh, are panelists who I will actually be speaking today. And you will be able to see and hear those people, but you won't be able to see uh, yourself or other people, other attendees of the meeting and we can't see you. So. Um, you know, if you spend some time this morning getting your hair just right uh, in preparation for the meeting, I apologize, but we can't actually see you. Um, another thing that's different is with the Zoom webinar format is you'll see in, a, in your toolbar uh, a Q&A box. Uh, so this is a little bit different than the chat that normally happens uh, in a Zoom meeting. Um, the chat, I think, is, is shut off for everyone. I just posted a link in there where you can download the program booklet for this meeting if you didn't already have it. Um, but you, so you'll type questions into the Q&A uh, and that'll be mostly for our, during our presentations. Our panelists who are speaking today will be able to answer questions at the conclusion of their presentations. Uh, but if you have other questions about things in general uh, or the meeting, you can type those in there and I'll do my best to answer, but it's just me. so. I'll try to run the meeting and answer questions in the Q&A as I can, uh, but bear with us. I'm sure that we're going to have a few technical difficulties as we go along here. Uh, this is our first online event. So I just ask you to bear with us and be a little patient if we run into any snags and we'll work through them. Credit certificates. Uh, we asked you on your registration form if you need the credits, uh, either Forester or Timber Harvester credits. Uh, we're going to send those to you electronically using the email address you use to sign up. Um, you will be able to, uh, you know, that, so it will come as a PDF uh, for you that you'll be able to print out and turn in uh, as you go. Um, and then somebody, some people asked us, they said, hey, I'm going to be gathering around a computer with a couple of my employees or a couple of my you know, business partners, and all of us need credits. So that's the case. We didn't want you to have to sign up each individual person differently because you only log in as one person with one computer in use. So if, if there are other people watching with you, uh, you can let me know. That's my email address, cegan at massforestalliance.org. And let me know early next week and uh, we'll get those out to you. Um, but only for people who are actually attending the meeting with you. Okay, so please don't abuse that. Um, and finally, I, I wanted to thank our sponsor today. Farm Credit East has been a major sponsor of uh, the annual meetings, MFA's annual meetings for many years. Uh, we're glad to have them on as a sponsor again this year with our annual meeting. Thanks to them, we're able to offer this meeting to you free of charge. And we have with us uh, from Farm Credit, Chris Lawton. Um, and we've asked him to uh, tell us a little bit more about Farm Credit East and share some information about uh, what they exciting things they have to offer to uh, MFA members. Chris? Thank you very much. Let me just um, share my screen. And let me know when you can see that. Yep, you're good to go. Okay, thank you very much. So um, on behalf of Farm Credit East, I wanted to just give a real brief introduction and thank you to the Mass Forest Alliance um, Farm Credit East, I know at least some of you are familiar with us, um, but some of you may not be. Um, so a very brief introduction here. Farm Credit East is part of the National Farm Credit System, which is a federally chartered network of borrower-owned cooperatives. So we're owned by our borrowers, uh, which, is, which is you folks. Um, we turned 100 years of age in 2016 and the farm credit system is made up of 73 associations across the country like us uh, that cover the entire nation. Uh, here's our service area, including all of Massachusetts. Uh, we have 20 offices, uh, just under 500 staff members, seven and a half billion dollars in loans. And notably we distribute um, a significant portion of our earnings back to our members uh, and that's totaled $900 million over the last 24 years. So it's, it, the dividends are substantial. Uh, here's our loan portfolio. As you can see, uh, forest products, um, 
timber land ownership, harvesting, uh, sawmills, other processing activities are all included in that. And um, that 10% represents more than $700 million invested in the Northeast uh, forest products industries. Uh, although we're known primarily for loans and leases, uh, we do have a full suite of business services, including tax prep. We do more than 10,000 tax returns a year for our members, uh, business consulting, appraisal, grant writing, uh, benchmarking, et cetera. Um, I do wanna mention a program that we have called Farm Start, which is geared towards uh, startup enterprises, uh, zero to three years stage. Um, it provides seed capital and working capital for beginning uh, farming, fishing, and forestry enterprises. And we have done several forest product um, enterprises. I know that there's been some uh, loggers that we've gotten started. Um, it's been going on for 15 years and we've done more than 300 new businesses. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll conclude. Uh, I don't wanna take up too much of your time this morning, but um, if you're interested in learning more about Farm Credit East and how we might be able to serve you, you can find us online or you can um, reach out to me directly and I will route you to the right person. So uh, I guess that's it. And I will turn it back over to Chris Egan. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, really, again, very grateful to Farm Credit East, great organization, great company uh, with, with lots to offer. So we encourage you to take advantage of, uh, of all those things that Chris just mentioned. Um, and again, thanks for being able to uh, be a sponsor and make this annual meeting free for all attendees. Okay, next up, we're, we're moving into our awards. Now, we normally handed out a number of awards at our annual meeting. Um, given the pandemic, the board decided to just uh, hand out two awards this year, our annual Mason and Cook Awards. So the first award we're handing out today is the Howard F. Mason Forester of the Year Award. And for those of you who don't know, this award is named for Howard Mason, who was a kind of a legendary forester for the Peck Lumber Companies in Westfield. And Howard was well known for uh, mentoring young uh, foresters and helping others. And uh, we're really, um, you know, really a, a terrific guy. And he actually received the Jack Lambert Award, which is uh, the Jack Lambert Forest Stewardship Award in 1996. So it was actually before MFA formed. We've been handing out our, that award for a while. It's sort of a, um, a lifetime achievement award in our highest honor. So Howard received that. And this year, the Howard F. Mason Forester of the Year Award winner is Joe Perry. And to, uh, to tell us a little bit more about Joe and, and explain uh, why he's being honored with this award, uh, I'd like to welcome Phil Benjamin. Phil is uh, uh, a consulting forester from Southeastern Massachusetts, and he is also uh, a member of the MFA board. Um, so Phil. Okay, that looks like it works. Yep. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks, Chris. My name is Phil Benjamin. I've been a full-time consulting forester working throughout southeastern Massachusetts since 1978. I first met Joe Perry when he replaced a service forester for Bristol County, who was retiring back in 1985. And I've worked pretty closely with Joe ever since that time. Joe has the perfect temperament for a forester, patient, understanding, knowledgeable, and kind, always willing to help a landowner, a logger, a forester, an assessor with any of a hundred different questions. Joe particularly enjoyed his time working with the Mass Envirothon. His role at the Envirothon every year was to teach and test the student teams about forestry in general and tree and shrub identification in particular. His state vehicle was always stuffed to the ceiling with branches and leaves, nuts and cones from trees and shrubs that he gathered during the year in an effort to have the perfect samples that helped the high school students to master their dendrology skills. He lived to inspire the students who took part every year and truly believed in the mission of the Envirothon. Joe also made a pretty, quite an impression on the landowners he met through the years. I can't tell you how many times I would meet with a landowner after Joe had been out on their property and they just raved about what a nice guy he was and how much they learned during his visit. They so appreciated his time and his willingness to share his knowledge and experience with them. Joe can be pretty persuasive at times as well. As well. He eventually wrote me in to help with his periodic presentations to the various con uh, county assessors associations in Southeastern Massachusetts. Joe would present and review the various aspects of the chapter programs 
and I would describe the role of the consulting forest in preparing the actual forest management plans for property tax relief. Our presentation last fall was out on a property of one of my landowners where the assessors could see exceptional examples of the types of forest improvement practices they read about all the time in the management plans. These included pre-commercial thinning, crop tree pruning, thinning for firewood, harvesting of some white pine. It was a really successful outing and the assessors were absolutely thrilled that Joe was able to make it happen. I am truly honored to be presenting Joe Perry as this year's winner of the Mass Forest Alliance's Howard F. Mason Forest of the Year Award. Howard was a steady and truly respected presence, presence in the forestry community and at many of the forestry meetings I attended over the years. Knowledgeable and so willing to share his, ex his experiences and thoughts on whatever situation arose. Dro Joe has been a true friend and valued mentor to me through the years as he has been to many other people. It is a fitting tribute to Joe and the work he has carried out in Southeastern Massachusetts and within the greater DCR family that makes this year's selection so easy. And so it gives me great pleasure and pride to present the Howard F. Mason Forest of the Year Award for 2020 to Joe Perry. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, they can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yep. Hey, thanks, PB. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Go, go ahead, Joe. Thanks, PB, for all that awesome uh, stuff you talked about me. Who is this guy that you're talking about? <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, what can I say? You're right, Phil. You're one of my best friends in forestry. John Clement, uh, my mentor through the years, and uh, wouldn't be where I was without John Clement keeping me in uh, focus on what's important. I want to tell a little quick story, then I'll get out. When I was 13 years old, I was out on a canoe uh, run. It was on the Allagash River. We're going down, and there was a guy out in the middle of all the property that took care of everybody. He had every, any piece of equipment you wanted. And the best thing he had is the only noise made was what was around. There was no other people, and that's how this guy liked it. Well, this guy left that job, went to college, got a degree in forestry, was ready to go hit the wilderness, and lo and behold, he was like in the heart of Metropolis, taking care of local farmers and everything else. And the last thing that they were allowed to do was to go out in this wilderness area. And uh, that guy was me. I realized um, what my true calling was, and it was in talking to people and educating them and telling them what they could do better on their property and then allowing them to make all the decisions. So thank you everyone who voted put me in and uh, it's a real blessing and uh, love you all. Great. Thank you so much, Joe. Congratulations. Okay. Um, so certainly a, a well-deserved award uh, for Joe and uh, really happy to, to honor him in this way. Uh, we'll have present another award a little bit later in the program, but right now it's time for our keynote presentation. Um, and we're really happy to have with us Dave Salino. He's the chief fire warden for uh, Massachusetts and works for DCR. And uh, this fire season certainly has been pretty unusual with the drought and the pandemic and Dave gave a presentation recently to the DCR Forest Stewardship Council, which was uh, very well regarded, very interesting, and attracted quite a bit of media attention as well. So we thought it would be uh, really interesting to hear from him today, and uh, and so we're delighted to have him with us. So Dave, uh, welcome. Okay, Chris. Well, thanks, thanks, Chris, uh, for the invite and the opportunity, and uh, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, congratulations to the award winners, Joe in particular, um, well-deserved, my friend. And, uh, and so um, I'm going to share my screen here, Chris. We'll get that out of the way. Okay, Chris, can you see that? Can everybody see that? Uh, we can see it, yes. Okay. So, um, 
So once again, thanks for the thanks for the invite to present to this group. Um, I was uh, uh, I got a call from Charlie Thompson uh, shortly after the recent uh, Massachusetts uh, Forest Stewardship um, um, meeting that I presented at, and uh, and so Charlie said to me, he said, "Boy, he said I really uh, liked that presentation on the fire season." And where we're at, and you know, everybody else seemed to like it. Dick and Crane was on it, and uh, you know, and he had he had some some real positives to say about it. And and my thought was, boy, either either people are listening to our messaging on fire this year, or the COVID nineteen pandemic truly has caused fatigue, and people are looking for whatever entertainment they can find. And so. Um, so I'm so I'm hoping that I can um, uh, uh, get something up in front of folks that that's uh, that's interesting for you. So what we want to do is we're going to talk about kind of a recap of the 2020 fire season here in Massachusetts. And the title here, uh, I didn't change the title. I was going to sort of update this and maybe adapt it to the to the uh, uh, audience we have here today. But it's 2020 fire season, not so normal, and it's uh, and you'll see a number of reasons for why it wasn't so normal for us here um, this particular year with a lot of different influences. But then, um, because of the audience and and uh, here in this particular group, let's finish up by talking about fire on the landscape in in Massachusetts, and uh, and that's pretty important. And you'll see that. Uh, I want I want to sort of let people know that you know we've made a real effort here and raised the bar on using fire as a tool, and so uh, hope maybe we can sort of get out outside the box on um, the negativity of fire. So um, so the first thing is I always start out with this, and this is always a it turns out to be a really cool uh, little bit of trivia, and. Um, and so we started, our mission started in uh, 1911 um, with the sole mission of providing aid and assistance to the prevention and detection and suppression of forest fires in the cities and towns across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And that holds true today. Um, however, you, one of the things that people are interesting to find, interested to find out is that across Massachusetts, we're a home rule state. And so that means that regardless of uh, what property our fires are on, the local fire chief has jurisdiction over those fires, whether it's on private or state land or town land. And, um, and that's important that we um, establish that partnership. And we we have a, we're pretty proud of the fact that we have an ongoing strong partnership with our municipal partners. And that even shows in how our districts and how our bureau is made up across the state. We've got 13 fire districts across the state. We have a district fire warden in each one of those. Uh, we still have three uh, patrolmen uh, across the state and we bring on roughly about 48 seasonals every year. And we have Alex Belote um, who came on two years ago as our prevention coordinator, program coordinator and Alex does a great job with volunteer fire assistance grant uh, recipients and prevention programs. But the important part is that these districts follow the statewide fire mobilization plan. And so it coincides with uh, mass emergency management, Department of Fire Services, and all of those towns um, um, within those particular districts. You notice Worcester County is broken into the north and the south, and so is in Middlesex County as well. And so that establishes that ongoing partnership that we have. And there's our, st our staffing level. I think it's important before we tell the story of the fire season is um, what we do as services. And this is fairly common across the country for state uh, fire management agencies. Uh, under this, typically all but three are under the state foresters across the country. And so, of course, we provide the wildfire response to cities and towns, but we're also responsible for state wildfire occurrence reporting on lands that are not federal lands. And that's uh, really important. That data goes up into the National Association of State Foresters database. 
and um, and is really important for us as states uh, to be able to tell that story and account for uh, wildfire occurrence across um, the country on non-federal lands, which leads to funding. Um, it shows where you know we have issues across the country on non-federal lands. Um, and so that's an ongoing process and we're responsible for that here in Massachusetts. We do our fire detection and, and you'll see a slide here on the fire tower network. Massachusetts, we're pretty proud. Massachusetts is one of the last strongholds of a really active fire tower um, detection system. We do prescribed fire on state and partnership lands. I'm going to talk about that at the end of the presentation. Um, we do MEMA response. So when we have these uh, natural events like hurricanes, uh, flooding issues, um, wind event, other wind events, um, we become a uh, response resource of the governor's office um, through MEMA. Uh, we run a robust federal excess uh, property program and the volunteer fire assistance program. We have uh, roughly about the, the 11th and we're in the top 10 actually of the strongest federal excess property programs in the country. We bring in through an agreement with the Forest Service and the DOD um, firefighting equipment, military equipment um, that can be augmented for um, fire response. Um, we run our wildfire crew nat and do national mobilization. Although this year we were really tied home, we did not mobilize um, anybody to the Western states. We were able to mobilize two uh, state fish and wildlife uh, firefighters up to the Green Mount or to the White Mountain National Forest here in the last two weeks. But that was it. We were tied to our own story here. We do all, a lot of wildfire training across the state. We train on average anywhere from 450 to 800, 900 firefighters a year um, across the state of Massachusetts. We do the fire danger rating. Um, we do, we're part of the state drought management task force, which was, as you can imagine, an ongoing, and that's actually still ongoing uh, to this day um, here in Massachusetts. And we assist um, DCR parks and forestry staff with some of their missions. So as I mentioned, there's 42 towers, believe it or not, across the state of Massachusetts, still operable. Um, on average, at our staffing level, on high fire danger days, uh, we can get anywhere from 22 to 23 or 24 of the key towers up and running. And this um, slide shows the um, this slide shows the locations of those towers. Notice that there's a lot of towers down in the southeast. And so here's your next bit of trivia: is that really the fire tower network uh, technology was invented and started? Uh, here in Massachusetts in the 1880s. And it started down there in Plymouth, um, Massachusetts. And the reason for it is, as you can imagine, it's, uh, they don't have uh, big changes in elevation. Um, they had big fires um, in the late 1800s through the early 1900s. And, and they needed to be able to see where those fires were and locate them um, to get on them early. So we run, um, we also provide specialized resources. And I, I, this slide focuses on our participation in using aviation as a tool to manage fire. And uh, this was a, a pretty active um, part of our role this year in 2020. And so through a, through a five partner um, MOU, uh, we DCR provides the air to ground coordination and communication um, with either uh, state police or National Guard uh, helicopters. Um, this is actually a process that happens when we get a fire, um, as we did say on uh, Joshua Hill in Leverett uh, back in June. Uh, initially, there's a request for a helicopter. We do the assessment, and then there's a conversation between myself and the state fire marshal and the director of MEMA. Um, as to whether we meet the criteria to fly a helicopter over a fire because, and mainly because as soon as we fly a helicopter over a fire, we drastically increase the hazards uh, to firefighting on the ground. As soon as we put a uh, rotary wing aircraft um, anywhere um, in the, the vicinity of that incident. So, uh, 
So this year was very active and we did, uh, boy, we did an excess of six or seven missions across the state between uh, state police and uh, Blackhawk uh, National Guard ships. As I mentioned, we do the Federal Excess Property Program. We're pretty proud of this. In 2015, we brought in six and a half million dollars worth of equipment. Uh, and that went to municipalities and even into our own state um, uh, inventories as well. And that's just an example. I never thought I'd be in the boat business, but we have, uh, we have 25 foot defender um, excess property boats from the Coast Guard that are in ports up and down the seacoast. And, uh, and have provided great support for rescue missions for those fire departments. And then we do prescribe fire. And uh, we uh, last year, you'll see a slide later on here that shows we did uh, over 2,100 acres last year in 2019 of prescribed fire. And this is just a growing program um, with a lot of benefits to it. And we'll, uh, we'll throw that up here um, towards the end. I mentioned we, we also support park operations. And so for those of you that have worked on timber sales and in the state, in some of our state forests or visited some of our state parks, you know that it's no secret that it's a challenge for uh, DCR or any state agency to maintain that infrastructure out on those lands. And, um, and so this year um, in particular, you know, here's an example in Townsend Willowbrook we did over 13 miles of forest uh, road improvements. Uh, proud to say that some of that equipment there is federal excess property. So we brought, you know, federal support, uh, became very uh, creative in how we use it, working with our, with our foresters uh, to do the design work and permitting. And, uh, and overall, in this particular case, we probably, uh, we probably did over $40,000 in uh, road improvements um, and saved a lot of money doing it. So <clears throat> jump into the fire story. And you can't, you can't talk about fire in Massachusetts without talking about the history of fire in Massachusetts. And for those of you who've heard me speak before, you always hear me say that Massachusetts has a rich history of fire. Um, I love to show these slides when I speak um, it, in other parts of the country uh, where, you know, in recent years, uh, in recent generations, you don't hear about large fire activity in the Northeast in general, unless it's, you know, one that breaks loose in the New Jersey Pine Barrens every now and then. But we do have the history and, you know, going back to the 1880s, you look at Bourne, uh, had a 25,000 acre fire, and that wasn't the only fire in the, in the late 1800s down there. But 1927, Townsend State Forest, uh, that was a pretty famous fire up in there that, that, that uh, blew off of a southwest wind, uh, six, took 16,000 acres in the end. It went into New Hampshire, and then the only thing that stopped it from progressing north was a wind shift that brought it back into Massachusetts and then a rain event. Um, in 1927, 27 was a, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of large fires documented in that particular era, but in Irving um, to Wendell, 7,000 acres that actually um, took out a chunk of the little section of Wendell um, up near Wendell State Forest. And there were a number of homes and farms that were lost from that fire. 1905, a famous fire off the Montague Plains that destroyed essentially the village of Lake Pleasant. Um, and, then, and then it goes on and all the way up to 1957 in Plymouth. It's probably our most famous fire, historic fire event um, in Plymouth, um, out of Miles Standish State Forest. And that fire burned 15,000 acres. The important part about that is it burned those 15,000 acres in about 12 hours. And at the height of that fire, it was consuming about 18 acres per minute. And the only thing that put that fire out was that it burned to Manomet, um, right on the beach, just south of the village of Plymouth. Um, and that's what put that fire out. Um, and so um, other fires, but up to recent history, 1999, for those that remember down into down in Russell, Tacoa Mountain, which went just a little over a thousand acres down there. And that was probably our last big uh, fire event. This shows some of the fire occurrence going back for the last 10 years up to 2019. And you can pick out sort of the wet years. 
I think what's important about this is if you notice our acreage, our, you know, our, our acres burned are, um, have substantially changed. And even this year in 2020, you'll see that, you know, our average uh, acres burned is, you know, is, is pretty low. And there's probably a number of reasons for that. But uh, this gives you a feel for um, what our fire story has been going back 10 years. And it's kind of leveled off or, or started to decline. And uh, as if you're a fire manager, that's one of the things that keeps you up at night, um, especially in a year like, like, like we had this year where we have the indices, we have the potential to repeat history. And you have essentially a population that is, has not experienced that large um, fire occurrence in generations. And so this is where, what we look like here so far in 2020, we've had 1,098 fires. We're still on average under, a, uh, under an acre per fire. Um, we had a couple of really challenging uh, substantial fires though that we'll see here in a minute. But, um, but we, we burned um, 740 acres. A big part of the story is we had over 130 residential homes threatened uh, this year. And that number is probably more realistically like up around 200 homes. And we rely on this data um, a lot of it coming in from local fire departments because we can't respond to every single one of these fires. Um, but we know that there were homes out there that were threatened um, that we probably couldn't capture in the data. We had uh, 11 residential homes that were either damaged or destroyed. And we had at least uh, 86 other structures that were impacted, either destroyed or damaged. We're proud to say that we responded, DCR responded to 267 of these incidents uh, providing assistance. And that became more and more important as the drought uh, deepened. And so here's how we compare to um, the other New England states for 2020 in numbers of fires. And we're right up there. We're actually up there just a little um, over um, what Maine has. Uh, Connecticut, uh, 455, and you know that's a pretty high number for Connecticut. Again, a lot of the data um, is dependent on participation from local fire departments, and so uh, you know, so for us in Maine, uh, we have a really close working relationship with with our local fire departments. It's uh, it helps to have those 13 district fire wardens out there in a year like this. They're you know communicating with those 24, 26, 28 towns in their districts almost on a daily basis. Here's what's a little different about this. When you, when you look at the numbers of 2020, numbers of fire, the fire occurrence doesn't, it's not that far over what we saw in 15 and 16, those dry years. 19 was really, 2019 was a wet year, almost no fire occurrence. What's different about this year is that at one point, by, by the end of September, this week of, of uh, September 28th, we had 15 fires that were still active, ongoing fires that we were holding in place. And that's what this map shows is that these were fires that were, were deep burning. Uh, some of these fires were burned in two feet into the ground. Um, granted, some of them were you know, half of a football field in size or an acre and a half. Um, we had one down over in Lemonster that was three and a half acres. Um, and essentially what we were doing is trying our best to hold these fires in place. In that particular week, we also had a red flag warning day that came to fruition uh, for us, meaning that the winds came up to 30 miles an hour. Uh, we had low relative humidities and, uh, fuels were just super, super dry. And so, um, so that was a real concerning week. If you're a fire manager, if you're me, you don't sleep well that week. And, um, and you're just, you know, you're just waiting to see which one of these is going to break out and become that uh, historical uh, repeating uh, type of a fire event. Um, so let's just talk um, 
quickly about some of the fires that we did see here in Massachusetts in June. If you remember, June is when really the drought uh, started for us and we it was called a flash drought. That's the new term for us these days. And, and, uh, and really it did, it did hit us like a, like a flash event that all of a sudden we went from uh, spring fire season that, you know, was not as actually below average, I would say. And, uh, and all of a sudden the beginning of June, uh, the spigot shuts off and we start to see air masses come in from Canada that are bringing with it, uh, uh, air uh, events, weather events, and weather conditions like we would normally see in the Western Plains with uh, humidities down in the 20% and every single day in high temperatures and every day that we see those, those fuels are drying out and drying out and drying out and indices for fire currents are building and building. And so we had, uh, we had, and we started to get lightning uh, activity. So we had this, uh, this was probably our second project fire, um, we had one in Southwick uh, that went to 24 acres, and then we had Joshua Hill. Joshua Hill is a really uh, interesting incident for us. It was actually on uh, on on two uh, land ownerships. Uh, two thirds of it was on uh, Division of Fishing Game, and then the other part of it was on uh, Cole's property up there in Leverett, just outside the village. And it was on some pretty rugged ground. And so here's the final uh, fire map of this. The story behind this is that uh, it was on rugged ground. It was on uh, chestnut oak, uh, dry ridge top. And the fire behavior um, on the first day was comparable to what we've seen in the Southern Appalachians. It was comparable to what we, we saw back in 1999 when we a bunch of us went on fires down in Kentucky. And uh, we had crews up there on, on June 25th that um, struggled and, 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 chal and were very challenged. Their safety was challenged um, in trying to get um, fire lines around this thing. And um, we had uh, helicopters from uh, Mass State Police that worked on it. Um, although they're, they run small buckets off of those state police ships. So because of the conditions and the amount of BTUs and energy coming off of that fire, the small buckets on those ships uh, were not really that effective. So it took us roughly about three days uh, to finally get containment. And the final acreage on it was 56 acres. What's important is that uh, what helped us get containment was a, was a cold front that came through with rain for about, it was the first rain that we had seen for that lasted about a six hour period. And that's what helped fire, fire crews get strong line around that, that fire. And that's that red perimeter line that you see. The next part of it, the, the tan shading called the objective box. And that's what the, that's what the potential of the fire had to go to the next uh, perimeter of containment, meaning either roads, you know, strong, and in this case, it was all strong roads, but that fire had the potential to be 435 acres if it had gone uh, beyond that. And, and it probably would have happened had we not had that one day or day and a half of, of a change in weather with much cooler temperatures and some precipitation. And that's how close we came to having that kind of a, you know, that kind of an incident. And if you think about it, if we didn't have Montague Road there and, and we didn't get any rain and we didn't have any intervention, how far would that fire have gone? It probably would have continued to the north um, and run the terrain of Ryan's Hill and some of the topography. So, um, and so the other part of this story is that the fire effects on Joshua Hill are going to be studied by our friends at, at Division of Fish and Wildlife for a number of years to the, you know, and studying the benefits of that fire occurrence. So we had a couple of other fires. Copacut Woods was down in Fall River, down in Phil Benjamin's uh, territory there. And, and this was one that really raised the hair on the back of our necks. This was a lightning strike fire that started up behind a resident, a residential neighborhood. Uh, this fire was, uh, was started, um, they, the residents smelled this thing for about three days. 
Uh, it smoldered in the ground. It burned very deep into the ground. And that section that you're looking at there on that map that looks like a timber sale um, outside the, the, uh, the subdivision is not a timber sale. That's where um, there was massive 100% oak kill um, from winter moth and gypsy moth um, back 10 years ago. And so the fuel type had changed. Uh, the drought uh, conditions were perfect. And we get this fire that started there. And in, the, in the first uh, two days, we got containment on the fire at about five acres. And we thought we had containment until two weeks later where that fire burned a foot and a half in the ground out through a dead uh, oak root system, came outside the perimeter and made a run of about two acres and threatened those homes uh, with 25 to 30 foot flame lengths on the north side of it. And then it broke out again a week later. Um, and so that's, those are the challenges that we faced with drought induced fire behavior. And uh, by this time, uh, this was Freetown, the Freetown area was now transitioning into extreme drought conditions. And if you, the other part of this is if you think about it and look at the open land, this is a fifth, this is within the 15,000 acre Southeast bioreserve. Look at how much open uh, territory of pitch pine, scrub oak, uh, uh, dead oak. Um, look at how much area that fire has to run. And this thing had the potential to be well over a thousand acre fire if we had a south wind on it blowing it into the Freetown State Forest. The next one was Tully Mountain. This was a small little fire, great little success story though. We used the county hand crew that we trained up. I know Nick Bianzoni's on this call. He was part of this uh, operation to train, this, train these crews up and these resources, but we held a fire at uh, half an acre on the summit of Tully Mountain. There's no access except by hiking in. And uh, we used a helicopter on this and the uh, crews did a great job because the potential there was for that fire um, and to actually run around the, sem the summit off of a north wind and then uh, run terrain driven, topography driven um, across the ridge top. And that one again had the potential to go well over a thousand acres with the right conditions. Um, so uh, in, 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 fit, in sort of getting to the closing here, what drives this for the audience? And I always put these slides in. This is, um, this is all about fire behavior and it's fuels weather topography. And so the red arrows show, you know, what, what was influencing our fires this, this season. And it's uh, fuel moistures for sure were super, super low. Um, size classes. Um, we had the larger fuels in the forest uh, down and dead up to six inches in diameter were now um, by July totally available to burn and we saw them being consumed and that just provides more heat and energy to any of these fires that get going. The fuel loading of course um, is always there. We're always looking at fuel loading from storm events, uh, insect um, mortality, all of that plays a role and live fuels by the end of, Ju of July started to cure out. The grasses in the Southeast started to cure out in the shrubs and they started to burn. And so when it's weather, it's about air temperature, relative humidity, precip, the drought conditions. And then we had lightning activity and we don't get a lot of lightning fires in Massachusetts, but, uh, but we'll get one or two. Uh, this year, we think we had a lot more than that. Um, that were probably lightning strikes. And that's because of the drought conditions where, uh, you know, we can get lightning strikes into an area that's, uh, you know, got some real dense, uh, perfectly arranged fuels and, it's, and it's, it's powder dry and now ready to burn. And this is where we were at um, by the end of September, extreme drought across that Southeast region, but don't discount that whole Pioneer Valley area in East and, uh, and because that was, um, that was severe and the fire behavior showed it. So as I mentioned, we're part of the drought management task force. And so uh, we're, we provide um, one of the six elements that gives the state drought scoring and that's the Keech Byron drought index. And this is a fire drought index. It's all, this, it's all about the, the top eight inches of soil layer 
in how available the organics in that soil layer, how available they are to burn. And it kind of tells you a little narrative there on, on what the scale is. Zero is that the soil, that soil layer is 100% fully saturated and 800 is really bad. And, uh, and so we actually bounced up uh, towards the 700 mark even after this. This shows you September 2nd, but it also compares you to a year ago in 2019. So I picked this one. By the end of September, we were running um, 600s uh, from Norfolk County, um, Hopkinton, of course, North Worcester County, and down uh, into the Cape, and then out on, on the vineyard. Um, um, the vineyard got up into the high 500s. And so this really measures um, what we can expect um, for fire behavior um, that's drought induced. It caused us to have to change our tactics and we needed to be very adaptable uh, to these conditions. And so on the upper left hand corner, uh, this is that Copacut Road fire that I talked about that, uh, that broke out after two weeks. And, and ultimately after the second time it broke out, it's, you know, you have to say to yourself, we need to change our tactics. And so we put, a, we put our dozer in there. We have, we have one dozer in our bureau and we have a tractor plow. We haven't sunk that tractor plow into the ground since 2001 and we did it and that put that fire to bed. It contained it within a perimeter of, um, of mineral soil. And uh, you can see the burn uh, severity on the left-hand side of that line. Uh, and that is actually just in the, just outside the backyard of one of those uh, residential homes. On uh, the center is uh, Joshua Hill in Leverett, and you can see the severity of the of the burning that was ongoing. It produced a smoke issue for us. Um, there was uh, there was group torching in hardwoods and hemlock on the top of that mountain during that fire. Uh, on the lower left is um, a little bit of a success story for us in Freetown State Forest, and this was a fire that started off the road. Uh, it was an incendiary device that started that fire, and, and you can see that the fire, uh, it was only an acre, and, uh, and it actually really uh, uh, browned out the canopy almost to the top of that uh, hardwood canopy, but on the right-hand side, um, we did not get any fire on the right-hand side of that road, and that's because we had done the fuel mitigation work. Um, on both sides of that road with help from the Forest Service. And so it shows that that work um, really uh, was successful. And then of course, on the right side, one of our favorite photos from this year's fire season, that's the top of Mount Tully. That fire was just below the ledge and we used uh, Blackhawk uh, helicopters to, to douse that. So um, 2020, not so normal for fire control. And that's because of COVID-19 the risk management stuff. So, you know, you see, so have a pandemic, um, you know, and then why not throw a drought on top of it, right? And, uh, and so this was really not so normal for us. And so we had to manage the risk to our staff all the time. And, um, and we did this through um, an incident management team. We have the trained staff. It dawned on me that we've all been through it. And so we, so we ran an incident management team uh, to manage this issue and make sure that all of our staff were being briefed at every, actually twice a week on, on COVID mitigation, safety issues, um, you name it. Everybody was briefed up and, um, and making sure that we were all on the same page. And here's an example. We produce this document every single week um, uh, right up and through um, last week. And it gives us um, objectives it lays out clear messaging uh, and uh, assignments. So we had some concerns going into fall and, and, uh, and that was the precip de uh, deficits, leaf drop, average temperatures, and they came to fruition right up until last week. And now we've seen a change in the weather pattern, which, um, which hopefully continues for us. And we haven't seen a lot of fire activity since we had the cooler temps. So let's talk about, um, I want to finish up. We've talked about sort of the bad fire and the negative fire. And I thought a lot about the audience here uh, with, the, with the Alliance. And, you know, we've got 
I, I think it's just such a great group from the years when I was involved with wood producers and MAPF and you folks have done such a great job and what a powerful group this is. And, um, and I thought, let me, let me see if I can't uh, trigger some, uh, some thoughts and, and questions and that go outside the box about something like fire. And uh, so let's talk about prescribed fire and what we've done. And, and I call it the good fire. Right. And as a matter of fact, for you, Twitter, for your social media gurus out there, uh, and I'm not one of them. However, the only one that I do is Twitter. And um, and so I do it for fire. And if you go on Twitter, I it took me uh, it took me a couple of years to finally realize what the hashtag thing was really all about. So if you go on to Twitter and you search hashtag good fire or hashtag RX fire, you are going to come up with an incredible plethora amount of um, prescribed fire information um, that are, is going on all across the country and um, really good source of information. And so we burned for, um, we burned for three different objectives in Massachusetts. Uh, one is hazard uh, fuels reduction, um, ecosystem restoration. And, you know, a lot of our burning happens in the southeast down on the pitch pine, scrub oak pine barrens and trying to restore those pine barrens to a resilient landscape. Um, in a, it, but it's a fire dependent ecosystem. It needs fire. And we've done, a, you know, somewhat of a good job of excluding fire from it for public safety issues, but it wasn't such a great thing when it came to the health of that overall ecosystem. And so, um, so we do that. Um, and then we do a lot of fire training for local fire departments. One of the famous lines coming out of, out of uh, burn, one of the first burns we did in 2010 in Miles Standish was the fire chief saying 95% of his staff had not ever seen the fire behavior potential coming out of this, these fuels because they've been removed from it two and three generations. But I wanted to add a fourth one because of this audience. How about civil culture? You know, we know that we know that our red oak forests are, are disturbing disturbance dependent and to we know that that oak region oak responds very favorably to fire and in some cases it really that's the one thing that's missing to try to get oak regeneration established and so we're starting to look at that especially in the central um, highlands part of massachusetts and the oak hickory stands and you're going to see us start to toy with this um, um, in whatever form or fashion we can to try to do site prep work using fire as a tool to prep those um, shelter wood cuts or seed tree cuts up for successful oak regeneration. Um, here's a, a little bit along the lines of public safety. So this is this is Miles Standish State Forest um, down in Plymouth, and uh, and it shows a subdivision. Um, called the Chardonnay subdivision with 251 homes and 96, over $96 million in real estate values. They're at risk from a fire off of the state forest to the left of that road on a Southwest wind. And so we're actively burning um, on, on the left side of that road in the state forest. And that's all about uh, maintaining those um, fuel levels and doing the hazard uh, mitigation work. So um, here's a success story. This is, and, and it's not even just me saying this, but folks from around the country, Massachusetts has been kind of like the little state that could when it comes to prescribed fire. And last year was just a great example. There's a couple of reasons for this, um, partly because we didn't have a fire season last year. So DCR assets could be, you know, very involved in supporting a lot of this. But we burned over 2,100 acres across uh, Massachusetts last year, and, he, and this shows this shows the land ownerships. And DFW was right up there, almost um, up against 800 acres. Um, we burned just a little over 200 acres in our area in, in on DCR lands, and but look at private 173 acres in private burns. Uh, we assist the feds down in the uh, Fish and Wildlife. Uh, service lands. And then uh, there was another 200 acres on DOD fed lands, meaning like Westover, 
um, in Devons in those areas, and then and then municipal burning as well. So, um, so it's pretty active in, uh, in, you know, we want to keep it going 2020. We, as like everybody else, we can't wait to get out of it because we curtailed burn programs across the state, across the nation, really. So to meet these, um, so to have this become a success, it takes a strong partnership. And this just kind of lists out who they are, but we've had strong partnerships with Nature Conservancy, the Mass Military Reservation on the Cape, Division of Fish and Wildlife, our sister agency, we can't say enough. That is just the, D the DFW, DCR collaboration and partnership is huge and it's um, becoming more and more of a model for other um, prescribed fire programs across the country. Our municipal fire departments are um, imperative. And remember that fire chief has the go or go no uh, or no-go um, decision in the end um, as to whether we burn or not. And so the finish up, um, we, uh, I, I thought I'd share some lessons learned with the group and I always, uh, in my four, uh, our foresters here in, in DCR, uh, some of the leaders have heard me say this uh, before is, you know, we've got some successes, uh, especially burning on uh, Martha's Vineyard, you know, we started ramping up our burning efforts back in 2010. And it was a no no back then that you were going to burn during the recreational season during the summer on Martha's Vineyard. And, and by 2016, we had the drought of 16. And we didn't burn on the vineyard at all because of the drought and residents were asking us when we're coming back to burn so that we could kill all their ticks. And, uh, and that was, uh, and that told us a lot about the culture and how it was changing, but there's a reason for that. And that's that, you know, we have been open, honest, and transparent. We do, we don't shy away from doing public meetings and just sharing what we're doing, what our intentions are, what our plan is. We like to tell our story and, um, and, and, you know, if we don't tell our story, then shame on us. Somebody else is going to tell our story um, according to what their agenda is you know, plan outside our world, think outside the box. And, you know, in the fire world, we've had to learn to be flexible, patient and adaptable. And um, those are some great lessons learned that um, have come out of our prescribed fire program. And, um, and here's what's the future of it. Um, so there's, <clears throat> we've already identified that there's probably over 16,000 acres on DCR, DFW and conservation's land that could use a reintroduction of fire to the landscape, right? And so with this group, this is a slide I added particularly, uh, specifically for uh, MFA, and that is using fire as a tool on private land ownership. How do we do that? I don't have the answer to that. I put a bunch of question marks there um, because I know there's been talk about this and, uh, and you know, it's probably worth, um, we want to keep that conversation going. How do we, as a group, um, come together and, and try to make that happen? Um, there is a Massachusetts prescribed fire council in some form or fashion coming to Massachusetts in the near future. There's 42 of them nationally. Um, we know that we've needed one for a while. And, um, and so that will help those efforts. And then um, how about uh, prescribed training, um, fire training for foresters. Maybe uh, maybe it's in the form of just how, how does a burn plan work? How does it, you know, how do you develop it? And I always finish with this slide. It's, this, is a, this was a test fire of a, of a quote, controlled burn down on, um, on Martha's Vineyard uh, back in like 2015. And, uh, and so this is the potential um, for fire behavior that we have. It's in modern times and it's in color and it, it just, it's a good reminder of, of where we're at. And that is all I have. And thank you, thank you very much. And I'll uh, stop sharing my screen here, Chris. And I don't know if there's any questions. I, don't, I haven't been monitoring the Q&A, so. Yeah, there's... Uh... There's at least one question there. Um, I see from my friend, John Parrott. Um, yeah, so his, his second question is, uh, you know, could you talk about the impacts of increasing population density and climate change on the fire risk? Sure. 
Yeah. So, you know, there's uh, the climate change, of course, it's no uh, surprise that, that climate change comes up in the conversations of fire management. And, uh, you know, are we seeing it? Yes, we are. It's a, uh, we have Southern pine beetle in Massachusetts. It's been, you know, it's been trapped at, <clears throat> at, um, at the Montague uh, Plains. It's been trapped down in Miles Standish. It's on Long Island, and that is that could very well have a serious impact on the pitch pine stands down there, which will change fuel types. And that is all about, you know, a changing climate. Um, the flash drought frequencies, um, you know, this year shows the potential of what that flash drought scenario brings. And I will tell you that when I share those, when I share those slides about the 101 of fire behavior and what influences fire behavior, it's the same. Those slides apply to Colorado this week. They apply to California. They apply to New England. And, and so it's weather, fuels, topography, and it's all about when, the, when those issues line up. And this particular year, 2020, we had days where we uh, just missed perfect lineup with wind events, low humidities, and um, high temps. We missed them by hours. And if we had a start at the right time, um, we would have we would have had a large fire. There was absolutely the potential for us to lose structures and um, and values at risk. You know. And and for the for the private landowners watching, um, are there any tips you have for them in terms of assessing their own fire risk or reducing it or what they should be? Yeah. For? So, you know, we had this, we had a conversation yesterday about some of the development that's, that's ongoing. It's, um, it's really a concern, uh, especially down in the Pine Barrens and some of the development that's going on in, in Plymouth. And, uh, you know, there's, there's the, there's a lot of resources available at our agency to connect you with Firewise and the Home Ignition Zone um, um, resources and recommendations. And uh, it's about learning to live with fire. And this is what um, this is what I talk about when we start talking about culture change. Is that fire agencies um, across the country are looking at uh, rather than telling people that we're going to prevent forest fires, is uh, that we want to learn to live with fire. And how do you how do you design your landscape um, uh, to be resilient? And then there's a question about uh, hemlock, lily, delgid, and white ash. You know, infected trees. Do those burn? Faster? Yeah. So any of the infects, any of the insect infestations that lead to mortality, essentially they lead to dead fuel um, conditions in the forest. And so standing snags um, became. Um, actually available to burn this year connected because they dried out in, in drought conditions. The fire on Joshua Hill and Leverett, we had group torching up there and we, and I think that most of that was, was hemlock woolly adelgid killed hemlock stands up on the dry ledgy um, soils there in Leverett. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Dave. That's very interesting, very informative, and I know people uh, people really appreciate uh, learning new things. And certainly, there's a lot of things uh, that we learned here today. And you know, it's in your program book. I've neglected to mention it at the start of the meeting, but uh, Dave was recently honored with a prestigious Fire Supervisors Award from the Northeast uh, Fire Supervisors Association. So, a very prestigious honor, and uh, congratulations to you, Dave, for that uh, recognition. Well deserved. Um, so terrific. Uh, we are going to move on. The next thing on our agenda is uh, another award. And uh, that is the uh, Doug Cook Wood Producer of the Year Award. Uh, this award was named for Doug Cook, who was a uh, uh, owner of Cook Forest Products in uh, Upton. Uh, Doug was also a board member for MFA. Uh, he was known for a spirit of innovation and he grew his business uh, rapidly and was a force for uh, the forest products industry in his area and, and statewide. And uh, this year we're proud to present that award to Paul, Paul Darling and uh, to tell us a little bit more about Paul and share the reasons for this selection. Um, we have with us John Clement who Joe referenced, uh, Joe Perry referenced earlier. So uh, John, will you please help us get to know Paul a little bit better. 
Good morning. My name is John Clement. I'm a retired service forester with the state DCR. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce Paul Dowling, president of Gurney Sawmill Incorporated in East Freetown, Mass, who is a recipient of the Douglas B. Cook Wood Producer of the Year Award. I'd like to take a few minutes to highlight some of the reasons Paul is deserving of this award. I've had a strong professional relationship with Paul for over 30 years and consider him a good personal friend. Gurney's Sawmill, Sawmill is a family owned and operated business that was first established in 1870 and is now celebrating 150 years of continuous operation this year. I first met Paul in 1987 when he was working at the sawmill for his uncle, Mert Gurney. In 1994, Paul purchased the mill from his uncle and due to his uncle's health issues, it had been in a period of decline. By investing a lot of time, money and hard work, Paul was able to quickly turn the business around and make it into the successful business that it is today. When Paul took over the mill, they were producing around uh, 500,000 board feet of lumber uh, each year. They're now producing about 1.5 million board feet of lumber each year. Paul has always utilized all the new and existing wood processing equipment and technology to either increase production, improve existing products, or create new products. In 1998, he installed a dehumidification kiln so that he could supply kiln dried lumber to his customers. In 1999, he purchased a tub grinder to process the bark from the debarking operation to, into uh, bark for landscape mulch. Due to the high demand for sawdust used for animal bedding, Paul constructed a special grinder to convert slabs into a sawdust-like material that could be used for bedding. Paul has always worked hard to expand existing markets and create new specialty markets for wood products. Uh, some of these include timbers for post and beam construction, lumber for wooden boat builders, and log cabin logs. Paul has created a strong working relationship with local loggers and landowners. He encourages loggers to use best management practices when doing harvesting operations, and he encourages landowners to practice good forest management on their property with an emphasis on long-term management. Over the years, Paul has developed a reputation for dealing fairly and honestly with loggers, landowners, and customers. It is my pleasure to introduce my good friend, Paul Dowling. Hi, my name is Paul Dowling. I own Gurney Sawmill. Uh, John is a good friend of mine. Uh, keeps me out of trouble quite a lot. Gets me in trouble sometimes. But uh, I appreciate the award and uh, been working at it for quite a while. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Paul, and congratulations to you. Uh, it's uh, really Terrific that we have uh, both winners of our awards today are both from southeastern Massachusetts. So it's great to see it may not be the first region of the state that people think of when they think of forestry, but certainly a strong and thriving business. And, and for a, a business like Gurney's to have stayed in business for 150 years, that is really remarkable. And, uh, and you know, be a sixth generation family business. That's, that's truly incredible. So congratulations to Paul and uh, and Joe for their awards today. Uh, really happy to honor them both. Uh, and now we're gonna move on to, uh, to our next um, presentation. Uh, some of you may have seen in the Forest Update newsletter that we announced a new joint uh, partnership grant program uh, with Mass Wildlife and the Mass Forest Alliance um, called the Collaboration for Private Forest Land. And this will help uh, landowners receive grants to create habitat, wildlife habitat on their property. Um, we're really happy to have uh, Marianne and Pat with us. When I started at MFA, uh, there were two of the people I met very quickly. Um, not only two of the nicest people you ever meet, but uh, also two of the smartest and most capable. 
I've learned a tremendous amount from uh, going out on habitat walks with them, at tree farm field days, uh, watching their presentations at, at other conferences and, and um, just speaking with them both. So it's a real delight to have Marianne and Pat with us and uh, I'm gonna uh, turn things over to them. You just need to uh, unmute yourself and uh, we're running a couple of minutes ahead of schedule, which is remarkable. We're all new at this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to thank, uh, whoops, sorry. I'd like to thank Chris and um, we're, uh, for asking us to present at this meeting as well as um, express that I'm excited about our partnership and um, working on this grant and really looking forward to working with all of the, the members of Mass Forest Alliance on um, implementing this and, and getting projects out there on private lands. Um, so my primary responsibility uh, working at Mass Wildlife since 2008 has been to work under partnership with the Natural Resources Conservation Service um, to plan habitat management on private lands. And so um, this, is, this grant is pretty much in, in line with continuing that kind of work. Um, for the sake of this presentation, I'm kind of gonna assume that folks are pretty familiar with NRCS, but if you're not, um, you know, you can ask questions in uh, the chat or wherever, and um, we can address those questions at, at the end. Um, so Pat and I are both going to talk. Um, I have about six slides, and I think Pat does about uh, this new funding pool under NRCS, um, which is a partnership between Mass Wildlife and Mass Forest Alliance and can address both of our goals and utilizing the resources we both have to offer and bring to private lands. Um, so Mass Wildlife is charged with conserving plants and animals native to Massachusetts um, as a means of serving um, the public. And we're responsible for the species that occur in Massachusetts, but also work with other states in the re Northeast in the region to coordinate on wildlife related management concerns and issues. So we bring those sort of regional um, efforts and initiatives um, to within our state, but we're also cognizant of, of the region itself and, and the issues we're addressing there. Um, and Mar Marianne, we can't, if you're sharing slides, we can't see them. Um, oh, sorry. So you'll, you'll need to share your screen so you can. Thank you for catching that early on. All you've missed is my title slide. And so where do I share the screen? Marianne, there's a green button at the oh, bottom. Oh, got it. <laughs> you can override my presentation. Yep, there you go. Okay. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Um, And I don't know why it's, okay. So there's my title slide that you missed. And here's the next slide that I was kind of talking about what Mass Wildlife's um, charged with in terms of you know our agency within the state and what we work on. So um, basically maintaining and restoring uh, or restoring our native biodiversity. Um, with respect to our partnership for this grant, our mission to, to manage natural resources on public and private land are aligned uh, for this. And we recognize that when we um, you know, chose to work together on this partnership. It will enable us to address um, those objectives that we both have more directly and address how they overlap. Um, so we both recognize that all residents of Massachusetts benefit from management of its natural resources and that it's important um, to ensure that residents value the natural resources, the, the services that these natural resources provide to them, uh, whether they're private forest landowners or, or not. Um, we also understand the role that private lands and private landowners have in management of natural resources and their desire to do so. So 
with those um, kind of objectives and our missions of our agency and the Mass Forest Alliance, um, we feel like this grant will be good to move forward working together and, and helping us all to reach our, the goals that we have. We also recognize that private landowners um, need guidance from natural resource professionals to implement management on their properties and that they often need funding assistance to do so. So, um, you know, we think that, that this will help us again to address our goals and to also address the goals of private landowners. So Mass Wildlife, just as DCR does, have has some guiding documents that we've developed to help us to um, direct our efforts in terms of, of um, maintaining native biodiversity and managing for them. Um, similar to the DCR state uh, forest action plan, we have a, a state wildlife action plan. And for any of you who attended meetings or presentations I've done before, I've talked um, about some aspects of this document. Um, and um, what it contains and how we use it. Um, it does contain the 570 species of greatest conservation need that we've identified in Massachusetts. And again, these are species that are common to the region, to other states as well. And it includes all the state listed species as well as some other species that um, we identify as rare or declining or in need of conservation actions um, for other reasons. We've associated with those species with 24 different habitat types within this document. And we've identified six actions that need to be taken in order to um, conserve these species. One of them being habitat restoration and management, which is the tiny little world I live in um, and some of our other staff live in as far as addressing the actions within this um, document. We also utilize um, Biomap 2. Uh, which was a, a um, mapping exercise in a sense developed um, by our heritage program in um, partnership with some other folks, including the Nature Conservancy. And this document um, and mapping contains, did, did an analysis of areas across the state with high ecological integrity. Um, and it's important for us to be working within those areas to conserve those components of the landscape on which species depend. And they include large landscape blocks, which are undeveloped areas, um, areas with forest core that are areas that are primarily forested that are not impacted by roads and development are pretty well intact. Wetland cores, aquatic cores, natural communities. And again, those species of conservation need identified in the State Wildlife Action Plan are included in here, along with some other things. And this mapping um, covers the state and it's available on, on Oliver. And it's something that I use often to, in looking at private lands and the features that those land, those private lands contain. Um, so for this grant, uh, so here's just an example. If we were to take our state wildlife action plan and biomap and combine them and identify areas of the landscape across the state that might um, contain a couple of these components. So if we look at from Biomap 2 landscape blocks, which are pictured in blue here, we can see those are large areas that are primarily naturally vegetated, not necessarily forested, but naturally vegetated and not impacted by roads or development. So they're pretty well intact. And then the yellow areas are forest cores. And those areas within the landscape blocks are primarily forested. So then if we take, so that's from Biomap 2, and if we take from our State Wildlife Action Plan, species that are in need of large landscape mosaics that contain diverse habitat types and their wide ranging species, we have these five species associated with that particular habitat type. Um, top left is spotted turtle and top right is Blanding's turtle, and I think all of you probably can recognize the other three species. Um, so these are species that need large landscape blocks. They use a variety of habitats within those landscape blocks. So if we're gonna conserve these species, um, we not only wanna look at where those species occur on the landscape, where we know they occur, but also where can we provide those species with those habitat features? And where could we manage um, within that landscape to conserve these species? So that's kind of just an example of how we might use um, the State Wildlife Action Plan and Biomap in conjunction with each other. 
So in, to sort of apply that concept um, to this grant, we, we did a similar exercise with certain species and habitat types that we might um, be able to focus on. Um, so getting back to our um, sort of how our goals align, these are some statements that I took out of our state wildlife action plan. Um, and so we all know that that private forest landowners or, or private private forest land makes up the majority of the state. So in order for us to address our goals, in order for us to address um, management of forest land or wildlife habitat, we need to certainly be working on private lands to do that. Um, we know that we cannot just manage um, forest. We cannot just manage for wildlife habitat on state land that we need to be working with private for private landowners to do that. Um, we also know that from a landowner perspective, many landowners have expressed that wildlife habitat is important to them. One of the reasons they own their land that they'd like to keep their land is because of the benefit to wildlife that it um, that it offers. And we also know that um, you know, private forest, private landowners don't necessarily know how to manage their own land. So we need to bring them the resources that they need in order to plan management and implement management on their own properties. So these are things that, you know, we know from the private land, from a private lands perspective or private landowner perspective that, that um, we take into consideration um, with plan, planning on private land. So for this particular grant, um, it's called the Massachusetts Collaborative for Private Forest Land, the partnership between Mass Wildlife and Mass Forest Alliance. Um, I do want to point out before I begin talking about any of this or Pat um, continues with his section that um, this is an RCS funded grant, but it, and it does not replace any existing NRCS program. So um, the environmental quality uh, incentive program that many of you may be familiar with that's still there, funding through that, that can be used anywhere in Massachusetts is still available. So this doesn't, it's not replacing that, it's kind of, it's in addition to that. There's, there's um, this is another funding source through uh, NRCS. Um, so in this particular grant, in this, um, we've developed focal areas for this grant, which is kind of a re requirement of the grant we had to, you know, say, well, where, where exactly do we want to spend this money? So we came up with these primary and um, secondary focal areas for this grant. And in the primary, um, the primary focal areas, uh, what we did was we looked at species of conservation need that are most imperiled. And those are the yellow areas. You know, where do we have some of these species in the state wildlife action plan um, that are, state listed and you know most imperiled and we did that because we didn't want to have those species be overlooked so we wanted to make sure we were incorporating and, and factoring in and looking at where where the most imperiled species are where we can do the the most to benefit those species and and uh, make sure that we're including those areas um, with funding opportunities and then we also included areas where more widespread species occur and those are the blue areas. So, you know, anywhere within those areas, um, properties would be eligible for this funding source. The gray areas, again, are still eligible for general equip, um, equip funds. So um, we also focused on, the, for those species, we focused on um, disturbance depend, species that require disturbance, ha, disturbing, disturbed habitats. Um, such as young forest or fields, um, even areas where we might implement prescribed burning because NRCS funds active management. So we need to be implementing some activity which usually involves some sort of disturbance, disturbing activity. But it will also fund the full range of, of what NRCS offers in terms of practices that would include smaller patch cuts like two or one or two acre patch cuts in a forest or, um, thinning uh, forest stands, um, and as I mentioned, creation of young forest and shrubland, um, pitch pine scrub oak habitats and other fire influenced natural communities um, or oak woodlands. So um, when we think about managing young forest habitat, you know, often people say, well, 
if you build it, they will come. And so that's that can often be the case for many migratory species that move across the landscape widely. But then there are some species that depend on uh, young forest habitat that don't have wide, don't, either don't migrate or don't really have wide dispersal distances. So we wanted to make sure we're factoring that in and focusing on that. And some examples of that are rough grouse. They're not migratory. They don't really disperse very far. So we're looking at where do we know rough grouse occur across the landscape and where, you know, we want to make sure that we know that and we're factoring that in and managing habitat for them in those areas. Same thing with New England cottontail. And another species that we need to factor in specific considerations for it is a migratory bird species, the golden wing warbler, but um, they, they will hybridize with a blue wing warbler. And we know from research that's been done and management that's been done in other places like Pennsylvania and Vermont that um, this species, that blue winged warbler tend not to breed at higher elevations. So we know that if we're managing at higher elevations, a habitat that's beneficial to golden winged warbler, we may be able to allow that species to breed in that habitat and not run the risk of hybridizing with another species. So um, those are also some of the things that we factored in into this mapping and will be factoring into to management for these species. Um, So finally, I'll just just conclude with these little lists I've gotten on the side of the, the slide here that, you know, what we bring together, um, both Mass Wildlife and Mass Forest Alliance in terms of being able to utilize this funding and implement this grant are, you know, our areas of our specialty areas between biologists and foresters. Um, mapping that we have, our expertise in planning projects, and finally coming together on outreach. We're, we're out there talking with private landowners, foresters are talking with private landowners. We, we talk with private landowners and, and, and kind of working together to conduct outreach to promote just in general, um, managing natural resources on private land as well as uh, managing under this particular funding effort. So uh, Pat's gonna take over now to talk a little bit in more detail about the actual RCPP, and we will both answer questions at the end of his section. Okay. Thank you, Marianne. Um, let me get started here. All right, um, so building off of uh, what Marianne uh, just went through here. Um, so good morning. Uh, thanks to MFA for providing the platform for us to talk about this, um, this new RCPP. My name is Pat Conlin. I'm a private lands habitat biologist for Mass Wildlife. I provide landowners recommendations on how they can protect, improve, or restore habitat on their land. I also assist landowners with applications to fund that management. Uh, today, I'm excited to announce the new partnership that expands on the available funds to do this type of work, the Massachusetts Collaborative for Private Forest Lands. So the, uh, the Mass Collaborative for Private Forest Lands is an RCPP, uh, that stands for Regional Conservation Partnership Program. Uh, it is essentially an earmarked pool of funding for habitat management through NRC, NRCS EQIP, um, the Environmental Qualities Incentives Program. Um, so like Marianne said before, I'll hammer this down. Uh, EQIP still exists. We have um, additional money um, to add on to it through this program. Um, so the same rules for eligibility are, uh, uh, um, apply to this um, with the addition of um, uh, our assistance for Mass Wildlife. Uh, the partnership between NRCS, the Massachusetts Forest Alliance, and Mass Wildlife um, brings together funding, technical assistance, and the collective knowledge of MFA to address declining wildlife habitats in Massachusetts. MFA and Mass Wildlife bring two important resources to this program. MFA has established networks of forest landowners, foresters, and wood producers to find the best projects. Mass Wildlife has the technical expertise to assist in planning and securing of funding for habitat management work. And many of you are familiar with the practices 
and scenarios offered by the NRCS Environmental Qualities Incentive Program. These same practices will be available to apply for through this program with the added assistance of mass wildlife biologists. This includes things like um, forest stand improvement, brush management, and a nod to Chief Salino uh, prescribed fire. The goals for this RCPP are to increase habitat for game and state wildlife action plan species, create more opportunities for landowners to access funds to complete habitat projects, and encourage the sustainable management and use of natural resources. Interested landowners should contact Mary Ann or myself if they are interested in pursuing habitat management on their land. The applicant must be the landowner of land certified under an active forest management plan. Um, funding is available to draft forest management plans, although the forester that writes it, if the funding comes through NRCS, must be a technical service provider. And with the limited number of TSPs in Massachusetts, I believe there's fewer than 15, uh, this could be a good opportunity for foresters to become certified. Uh, practices available through General EQIP are the same under this program and applications are ranked every third Friday of the month once the yearly allocation is made to the NRCS state office. Uh, applications will continue to be ranked until that yearly allotment is fully obligated or awarded. So let's run through the process of securing funding through NRCS under this RCPP. Um, First, we connect with an interested landowner or land manager regarding a particular property. This can come from direct outreach, a referral from NRCS, or by contacting Mary Ann or me. We go through the checklist to confirm that the landowner and property are eligible for NRCS. If not, we can explore other funding steps to take to become eligible, um, say getting a management plan written. Uh, we look at the Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program maps and Biomap too to see if there are any permitting or best management practice considerations. We also look at the surrounding landscape to see how management might complement what exists around it. Um, with our notes in hand, we schedule a site visit. Uh, we meet the landowners and hopefully the forester too. With boots on the ground, we can confirm or adjust what we identified in the office and take note of it. Um, the landowner will need to complete standard forms uh, to become registered with the NRCS. Um, your land is given a, a farm number, as they call it. Um, and at that point, eligibility for the program is confirmed. Uh, and at that point, we can start putting together a, uh, a plan. So if the property does not have an active forest management plan, it's not eligible for cost share from NRCS. The landowner will need to explore um, the options available to get a forest management plan written um, if they wish to apply. And there are a few different avenues. For properties already enrolled in Chapter 61, we will put together uh, the necessary paperwork to apply for RCPP funds. This includes um, NRCS job sheets, uh, maps, and natural heritage data release documents. Applications will be ranked by NRCS on a monthly basis. Those applications that don't rank um, into that particular month's pool um, will be placed into the following month's pool automatically. Uh, and the landowner will be notified by NRCS when they're approved for cost share. And at that point, they have a few days, I believe it's seven days to, um, to decide if they want to accept that um, funding and, and sign uh, a contract. Mass Wildlife will offer technical assistance throughout the lifespan of the project. Um, we will check in intermittently to see the progress and offer help if needed. Once the job is completed, NRCS will visit uh, the site to assess if it was completed to the standards set out in the contract. And if all those standards are met, the reimbursement is issued to the landowner. And um, we may be interested in biological monitoring um, post management to assess the uh, success of these projects. And here's that. Um, that focal map that Marianne showed, uh, we created this prioritization map to help direct our attention to the areas of our state that have the most potential to benefit vulnerable wildlife. Uh, we use data from the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program and known occurrences of New England cottontail to identify our um, uh, priority one areas, our, our top 
uh, focal areas seen here in red. Uh, the green areas are our second priority area. They consist of woodcock habitat, a model developed through the Wildlife Management Institute, uh, uh, data for rough grouse populations through um, uh, Mass Audubon's Breeding Bird Atlas II. So building off of those source uh, populations like Marianne uh, mentioned, and an in-house developed focal area for golden ring warbler, which um, identifies some of our higher elevation um, portions of the state, um, which is not only ben beneficial for uh, golden wing, but also um, some of our other neotropical um, migrants. And we're learning some interesting things about West Nile virus that could um, play into that too. As you can see, most of the state is included. Uh, it's a great opportunity for habitat management. There are several different sources uh, in addition to um, the, uh, the RCPP I've been describing for funding, um, depending on the forest ownership and or the type of project you want to uh, consider. Uh, Marianne or myself will direct you to the appropriate source that best serves the need of your property and project. And it's of note to mention that many landowners will utilize different sources of funding on the same property to expand on previous work. So this conference, the first time we've publicly talked about this RCPP um, through continued outreach and program awareness, we hope to assist in the creation of needed habitat throughout the state. We will use several strategies to reach out to both landowners and land managers. We think one of the better approaches is to let folks see what we are talking about with their own eyes and to hear what members of their own community think about these projects. The forestry community is integral to the success of this effort, and we would love to collaborate with anyone who has successfully participated in a habitat project or has novel ways of reaching the right landowners. And I'll leave our contact information up if you um, would like to reach out. And, uh, and that concludes my portion here. Great, and there, there are a few questions in the, uh, in the Q and A uh, panel there. Um, so is the, is the map that, that you guys just showed, is that available somewhere uh, right now? Or, you know, will we, would it become available to landowners? I mean, uh, it's not quite uh, available quite yet, but it will be. Um, it will be available, so NRCS, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, NRCS, the, their new federal fiscal year just started in October. So they're working on, um, developing all of the you know, criteria for funding and, and whatnot. So by the time we start funding projects in this fiscal year, we'll have, they'll have the map and it'll be available more widely. Yeah. And presumably, you know, MFA can share that as well. Oh yeah, yes, yes. I think we should have it on websites and things like that. Yep. Okay, and then there's a more detailed question from Mike Morey. Uh, Yep, I, I read, yeah, you probably want to read it though, right? Well, go ahead, you know, go ahead. You can, you can answer that. People can read it in the q &A. Okay. So a criticism we sometimes hear about habitat management efforts is that there is an excessive focus on single species such as the prairie warbler, which some seem to feel is a species that should be left to its own devices and allowed to shrink back to the Midwest. How do we do a better job of promoting the broader benefits of habitats that seem on the surface to focus on a single species, but actually benefit many species? So, um, yeah, so there are some species, and I kind of touched upon that, that, that need particular attention for various reasons because of the conservation concerns that face them or the challenges in ensuring that they don't disappear from the landscape. So, you know, we, we do factor some of those things in when we're developing focal areas for management, or even when we're, when we're on the ground planning management or implementing management that we have to pay attention to particular features within the habitat that, that certain species need or managing in areas where those species occur. And as I mentioned earlier, we do work on a regional level to identify species that are you know, of, of more critical concern. Um, we, they're referred to as regional species of conservation concern and which states and which areas it's, it's most important to manage for those species based on the opportunities that are available or 
uh, the species ranges and things like that. And for many species that um, might have expanded their ranges in relation to human land use practices, uh, many of those species we see across the region are declining everywhere in their historic ranges and their current ranges and there's um, negative impacts to their habitats throughout their ranges. And so, you know, in the Midwest, we see that um, land use practices, there's, you know, many areas where these species um, might have been in greater abundance in the past are uh, farmland now. There are cornfields and soybean fields and that habitat there is, it has been destroyed. So we need to look at what we have on the landscape today, where those things occur today and try to keep them present in their current, um, their current uh, ranges or, or habitat. So, um, you know, that's, that's why we make consideration or some of the reasons why we, we have to um, look at a, a single species in some ways and think about everything that that species needs in order for us to conserve them. But at the same time, uh, you know, as you can see with this map and the, and the fact that, you know, much of the state is covered, we are still managing habitat where more common species occur, including game species, you know, common game species. And so the management that we're doing um, benefits the full suite of species that are dependent on that, on those habitat types. I hope that answered that part of the question. Um, and as far as power, line, uh, power lines go, so the question is second, some seem to feel that power line rights of way, field edges and other open and shrubby habitats will provide all of the young forest and shrubland that is needed to sustain biodiversity. How do we better highlight the importance of the habitat management that is either a dedicated action or a byproduct of other forest management? So, um, when we're managing habitat and particularly when we're restoring habitat, which is the work that we do, um, you know, to great extent on state land, there are again, a lot of other factors that we're considering that aren't being considered in a power line right away or on a field edge. Um, we're looking at species composition. We're often trying to promote um, certain plant species, either the, the composition of the species or the structure of the species um, in such a way that it's going to address the needs of, of certain species um, by providing host plants for moths or butterflies, um, providing a structure that offers um, interstitial openings or things like that that are um, favored by things like whippoorwill. So we're paying much closer attention to how that habitat gets managed and uh, in structure and composition than someone might be just by keeping a power line and, you know, shrubby. It, power lines, as I'm sure many people know uh, here on this, uh, on this uh, meeting are oftentimes uh, composed of invasive species and the power line companies are not necessarily doing anything to, um, to manage the, the, the structure or composition of that habitat other than just to make sure it's, you know, not posing a risk to um, growing up into the power line and, and causing some kind of fire or issue with the power line. So, you know, we're, we're approaching our management differently than what takes place in those other types of, of shrub habitat. Yeah, I think the, uh, the woody structure is really important to bring into this um, conversation too. With a power line right away, the target for managers are the, the the is the vegetation that has the potential to grow into the wires. So, the um, ten year or five year reentry interval, those um, technicians are going and stump treating oaks and maples and hemlock and things like that. That we're hoping in a young forest project will become a really dense, you know, thousand stem per acre um, young forest habitat, which you know, all these species that are, are really suffering in our state require for um, foraging for the insects associated with those, those, um, vet, uh, those, those tree species and the cover that it provides from um, those uh, other uh, species of wildlife that are trying to eat them. And, and, and another thing is the configuration of these open areas. If it's a tight, narrow corridor, um, you have stresses from that interior forest and also the other way with nest um, parasitism 
uh, there's a lot of factors that go into it when you try to create conditions that are that used to be common um, as part of our dis uh, disturbance regime here before we um, domesticated everything. So I'll just expand on that with a little bit, uh, uh, just one more thing that the, um, as Pat mentioned, the configuration of these patches is also pretty important. So for, you know, some species won't nest close to an edge and not only the configuration, but the juxtaposition of that habitat to other habitat types. Um, so the placement of the habitat type is, is also um, a factor that we would consider when we're actively choosing where and how to manage uh, that type of habitat. Woodcock, for example, need um, shrub wetlands to be within a hundred acre block of, of wherever you're gonna put that um, young forest habitat um, and a few other different types of habitat. And golden wing warbler require um, a certain open area with association of 70% closed canopy forest. So there's, there's the augmentation, um, but at the end of the day, going back to the first part of the question, we're not focusing on a single species. These are species that sometimes are easy to monitor for and represent the conditions in which a lot of different species can, um, can exist. It's the habitat that we're really um, trying to manage for at the end of the day, not that particular species, so to speak. So thanks for that question. That was a good one to kind of get a little bit more in the nitty gritty of, of the actual management considerations. Yeah, great. And Mike, you know, followed up to say that communication is important. And, and so, you know, we will we'll look for ways that we can spread this message wider and help people understand because we do see with some of these uh, people who really don't like forest management that they will find excuses. They understand that habitat is a, a big issue. So they, they will find excuses to not do that. So we're, we need to push back a, little, a bit. I see Mike has a second component to that question, which is really the important thing, right? How do we communicate this to other people? And I think that, um, you know, some of the things, some of the ways we answered the question um, might be, could be incorporate included in how do we incorporate that uh, the importance and the fact that we're not managing for a single species. Um, and, uh, you know, as Pat and I both alluded to, um, we, we do have an outreach, you know, kind of component to this effort and our efforts in general. Um, and we are, you know, inviting folks on, at this meeting and also folks, forester members of MFA to engage with us and work on, you know, moving forward and, and conducting some outreach to landowners. So maybe that can be a deeper discussion with, with some folks um, in the future. And then there was one final question about elaborating. Could you elaborate on the habitat that needs high elevations? You, you mentioned, uh, I think the, the warbler that uh, can be interbred and so forth. Sure, so the golden wing warbler, which Historically, um, bred in Massachusetts, um, we don't think that they're doing it right now, or they may be doing it in um, populations below um, what we can actually um, record. Uh, there are still uh, active populations, breeding populations to the south and to the north of us in Vermont. Um, so we feel as though if we set the stage, we can bring them back in. The real issue um, facing golden wing in particular is a um, closely uh, related um, warbler, the blue winged warbler. They're 99% genetically related. They can hybridize and produce viable offspring. Um, through research that's been done in um, Maryland and Pennsylvania, uh, there's been a um, discovery of kind of a, a separation of the species preference for habitats based on um, elevation where golden wing will readily um, you know, breed in habitats that are lower elevation, um, especially associated with wetland habitats. Um, it's been found that when you create um, breeding habitat conditions in higher elevations, specifically above 1300 feet, um, you all of a sudden see a filtering out of the blue wings coming into that area. So the idea is the effort and the money put into a project you know, to benefit golden wing um, would actually benefit that species. Not to dismiss blue winged warbler, that's uh, another species on our swap list, um, but they would benefit from habitat work that was done, say for um, uh, woodcock or, or, or something else along those lines. 
So I want to also share some other research that's coming out of Pennsylvania. And um, I sit on a habitat technical committee that includes the Northeast states and we coordinate with the game bird uh, technical committee. And the game bird tech committee has been looking at the impacts of um, West Nile virus on rough grouse. And some research in Pennsylvania has shown that there's a particular mosquito species that transmits that disease uh, to all birds, but uh, rough grouse are particularly impacted by it. And they found that that particular mosquito species doesn't tend to occur at higher elevations, probably due to the temperature, not so much the elevation. And so uh, Pennsylvania is looking at mapping areas where they can manage to benefit rough grouse where they won't be impacted by West Nile virus as it relates to elevation in this particular mosquito species and transmission of West Nile virus. So um, that's another example of, we don't have the data for Massachusetts um, that they have and haven't conducted that research, but it's possible that you know rough grouse might benefit if we look at managing for them at higher elevations. And as I mentioned before, they don't migrate or disperse very far. So, so again, we need to be looking at locations where we know they already are to, to provide the greatest benefit to them. So that's just another example of uh, high elevation areas. And I see a question in the chat uh, that's kind of related to game species, I guess. So Pat and I, you know, we talk about private land being eligible for this grant, just kind of as private land. That does include sportsmen's uh, uh, or um, game clubs, fishing game clubs that have property to manage. We do often reach out, you know, often through our Mass Wildlife District offices. Uh, we have representation at the uh, County League of, of, of Game Clubs um, and coordinate with them regularly. We've had a number of, um, you know, game clubs apply for habitat management projects through and get funded uh, through uh, NRCS or through other grant programs through Mass Wildlife. So we, we do pretty much regularly work uh, with, um, with the game clubs on, on habitat management as well, those that have property and can manage for them. I just recently visited a, a couple just this fall um, and I'm working on management projects for them. Um, let's see, I think there's another question. Um, Morning warbler is another species. They're state listed as special concern. And we do tend to currently also have them at, you know, primarily only at higher elevations. I don't really know the reasons why or if there's anything in particular we need to do in terms of management for them. But basically when we look at where we know they are in the landscape, they're at higher elevations. Great. Um... I think that takes us through all the questions. So thank you both for, uh, for that great presentation. We really appreciate it. And I know that people might be contacting you very soon to learn more about this program. And, and hopefully we can uh, get some of this habitat created on uh, property owned by uh, MFA forest landowners. Yes. All right. Thanks again. Um, thank you. Thanks. We're going to... Uh, continue here. Folks can hang with us for just another few minutes. Um, we're going to just have a quick business meeting. Before we did that, I, I wanted to uh, note that in your program book is a listing of donors who gave to last year's uh, annual fund campaign. I've put some of the largest ones here on the screen. Um, but you can see everyone that gave $100 or more in the program book that you can download. Uh, you got that link uh, with the email or it's at the top of the chat. So please do take a look through that. And thank you to all those generous donors who helped us out. Um, we'll be launching our annual fund for this coming year uh, in the next two to three weeks. You'll get something in the mail from us. Uh, we hope you'll consider donating. Um, although we know it's a, it's a difficult time for a lot of folks, it is for us as well. So um, we, we hope you'll take that into consideration as you, uh, as you make your, your donation decisions shortly. Um, it's now time for the business meeting. Um, so in, the, in your program book, there is uh, a couple of things. The first thing we need to do very quickly is just approve the minutes from the last business meeting at last year's annual meeting. They appear in the program book. And what I'm going to do, the way we're going to vote on that is uh, I'm going to do it very quickly using a poll. So a poll should now be on your screen. 
And I wonder if you're an MFA member, if you could take a second and just vote to approve the minutes, which you can read in the program book. Um, just a uh, you know, one question poll. <laughs> to, uh, you can vote aye or nay to approve those minutes. Um, and the minutes themselves are very, are very simple. Um, so I'll give just another few seconds here for people to uh, to register their vote. Please do uh, take just a second to do that. It's very quick and easy. Um, and uh, just want to make sure we have enough people voting that we uh, have reached a quorum, um, which I believe we have, which is good. I'm going to end that poll now. Um, up next, I'm going to just very quickly give you a, a brief report. Uh, first is our finances are available in the program book. And if you take a look at those, you'll see that, you know, candidly, we had a difficult year. Uh, we were behind on our annual fund campaign. We had some additional expenses. We took on uh, a, uh, we contracted with a lobbyist, uh, Dan Bosley, who's a former state legislator and he's very well connected. He's been an enormous help to us, but that was, uh, you know, an additional cost. So again, we hope you'll uh, keep that in mind as we, um, as we head into our annual fund for the coming fiscal year. Uh, and then finally, just a, a legislative update as part of my report. Um, you may have seen that the bills, the, the two bills we were worried about got sent to this uh, combined into this commission, forestry commission bill. That bill didn't go anywhere. So that commission was never formed. We don't expect it to be. There are other bills in conference committees, uh, the, cl the climate bills uh, for House and Senate are in conference committees. So it was the economic development bill. We had to beat back some bad amendments to all of those. Uh, the concrete industry had an anti-wood construction bill. And uh, the House climate bill, you may have seen a little bit of kerfuffle about biomass power. Uh, there is a language in there that changes uh, biomass power for municipal light plants, which are town owned electricity generators, you might say, why is that? Uh, it has to do with the proposed Springfield biomass power plant, um, would you know, give them a little bit of, a, of an edge. Uh, we're not sure that plant's ever gonna get built. And if it is, uh, their permits require them to use only non-forest derived wood. So they wouldn't necessarily help our membership. Uh, and in fact, they're not our members uh, at the moment. So, um, if that goes away, that wouldn't have a major effect on any, anything we're doing. But what does have a major effect are regulatory issues that are coming down the pike here. And uh, the first is the Clean Energy and Climate Plan. Uh, every 10 years, the state issues a new one of these that lays out policy to help reach its goals. Uh, the first one ended this year with the goal of getting emissions 25% below carbon emissions, that is 25% below 1990 levels. And amazingly, we did it. Uh, successful. So the next CECP that goes through 2030 will have to get emissions 50% below uh, 1990 levels. That's going to be a lot harder because most of the low hanging fruit has been picked. Um, there's an implementation advisory committee that works with EEA, the Department of Energy and Environmental Affairs, to create the CECP. That those uh, advisory council or committee just released some of their policy recommendations, and they're somewhat disturbing. There's one in there that would remove wood from not only the RPS, the Renewable Power uh, Program, but also from the APS, the Renewable Heat Program. And the science behind wood heat, especially modern wood heat, is very robust. So we we're, we're, don't really understand why that is a strong recommendation of the Implementation Advisory Committee, and we're trying to push back on that. Um, then there's a couple other things, the HSAP is a Healthy Soils Action Plan. An early draft of this plan has things in it like um, forbidding timber harvesting when the leaves are on the trees. So that would shut off harvesting half the year. That would have a, a devastating effect. Another thing recommended in that plan would be to require timber mats anytime the ground is not either completely frozen or completely dry, which would drive up the cost of doing a timber harvest substantially. So these are things that represent real risk um, to the forest products industry that we need to push back on. Uh, the, the final one is the Resilient Lands Initiative. That at least contains some positive uh, language about uh, building with wood, which we know has a, from study after study after study, has a very uh, positive climate impact. Um, 
Amazingly, that did not factor in at all to the Implementation Advisory Committee working on the CECP, um, which is stunning that, that they would just simply leave out something that could have a major difference. Uh, Boston alone, the Boston area needs 185,000 new housing units in the next 10 years. If they were built with wood, um, there could be significant emission savings. So those are things that we're working on your behalf. These are all gonna be released in draft form in December. We're gonna need you to make your feelings known during the public comment period on them. So we wanna make sure that uh, everyone's aware of that and is going to uh, keep an eye on those things. And this is another reason why we really need your support so that we can devote the time, energy and staff to, to uh, push back on things that could be really harmful to us. Uh, finally, as part of the business meeting, we need to elect board members. Um, we have two vacancies on the board. We had two board members step down. The first one was Avril Cook. We're very sorry to see Avril go. He's been uh, not only a supporter of MFA, but he's uh, a forest landowner. He uh, is a timber harvester and he's worked extensively in, in modern wood heating systems all around the world. Really a fascinating uh, life story. So we're sorry to see Avril go. We had one more board member that we're really sorry to see go, and that's uh, Jim Kelly, who's been the chair of our forest, Foresters Council, uh, has been a member of the board, and is um, currently the secretary of the, of the organization. Uh, I looked for a good picture of Jim, and it's, it's kind of strange to see a consulting forester in timber harvesting equipment, but that was the best I could do on short notice. Um, but Jim's been a tremendous asset to MFA, and he's uh, Obviously, very well respected as a forester, has a, you know brought the New England cottontail back to his land in terms of wildlife habitat, um, and has been tremendously helpful to me personally. So, we are very sorry to see Jim go, um, yeah, but it's time for him to. Uh, he's got his hands in a lot of things, and he wants to take a step back, because working particularly on the executive committee is is time consuming. The executive committee meets every two weeks, and they're. Really, I'm in communication with them on uh, virtually a daily basis. Um, so we've got a very engaged and enthusiastic board. So we're gonna we're gonna reelect two board members today, and we're gonna add two new board members. So to replace Jim in April, um, the nominating committee, as you can see in your uh, program book, has recommended two new board members: Ken Conkey from John H. Conkey and Sons Logging. Um, Ken is well known to I think many of you. Um, he has been stepping forward and taking a leadership role lately. He's uh, testified at legislative hearings. He was gonna represent Massachusetts at the American Loggers Council uh, meeting before that was canceled uh, due to the pandemic. Um, and so we're grateful to have his voice as, as part of our board. And the second new board member will be Don Spear. Uh, some of you may be aware the Pine Tree Power Plant was recently sold to a company called Stored Solar. And Don is the new uh, manager for that plant. Um, and then finally, there are two board members that we are going to ask to be reelected. Uh, they've agreed to serve another term, Larry Lashway from Lashway Lumber and Peter Rayton, who's a, a timber harvester. So we're, again, we're gonna try to vote on this um, using a simple poll, uh, which I've now made available to you. Um, so I'd like to ask if you could vote to approve or uh, preferably approve the, uh, the nominations put forward by the nominating committee. Um, for these board members. It's, it's great for us to have some new faces as well as some continued leadership from, uh, from very experienced folks as well. So take just a second and if you can uh, answer that poll, I'll leave it up for another few seconds here because I know we're running a, you know, a little bit late. I'm really glad you're hanging with us. Um, so terrific. Uh, thank you for voting. Uh, and those board members are now approved and are officially board members of MFA. So thank you very much and congratulations to those new members. Finally, a few things is just as we wrap up, a reminder, we'll email you the credit certificates next week. If you have people that you, you know, had gathered around your computer that all need credits, please email me. I'll put my email and contact information up in just a second. Um, some of you may have noticed, I, we had a couple of reports that people were forced to uh, select something in the credit. It wasn't a mandatory question, but for some people, for the registration process, it appeared to be. So if you had to choose like forest or timber harvester credits and you don't really need those, you can email me if you want. Otherwise, I'll just make you an email use certificate. You can just delete that email. It's fine. Um, I wanted to alert you to one in-person event we're actually doing, which is uh, we're 
have on our schedule here. So we're going to do an in-person wood heat tour. It's going to be Wednesday, November 18th, starting at 1 p.m. It will begin in Chesterfield at Flat Rock Farm. It will make its way to TTC Energy in Dalton, uh, excuse me, in Windsor. Uh, and then we'll end at Holly, Holiday Brook Farm in uh, Dalton, um, which is now world famous thanks to the uh, burning of their hay bales, which I'm sure you've seen media coverage of. Uh, but it will be, uh, you know, we'll ask people to wear masks, we'll maintain social distancing, we'll it'll mostly be outdoors, we'll have uh, people rotate through indoor spaces. So registration for that will launch shortly, so keep an eye out for it. We'd love to have you come and, and we will be applying for credits for those uh, for that tour as well. Uh, so finally, you know, if you have anything you need to communicate to me regarding the meeting, regarding credit certificates, or if you just want to chat, tell me how things are going with your business, things we should be work, working on. We've heard from a lot of folks about property tax issues. Uh, we're working on an article for the next Forest Update about this with some tips. Uh, towns are really bumping up against budget issues, so they're looking for anything they can tax. And we're seeing that they're, they're taxing farm and forestry equipment occasionally for the first time, uh, which is an unwelcome surprise if it's going to hit you with thousands of dollars in new taxes. So um, look for things like that. But if you want to communicate to us, um, you know, there's my information. That's my cell phone. So please do contact me. Um, and uh, with that, I think, uh, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're going to uh, ask you if you, Peter Radin <laughs> points out correctly that I should note that if you're not an MFA member, we'd love for you to be one. We did lower the dues to just fifty dollars, uh, so please consider that. And uh, I think that concludes our annual meeting for 2020. It's been an unusual experience, but hopefully it worked well for you. And uh, I really thank you all for joining us, um, and uh, look forward to seeing you in person when that becomes uh, when that becomes available. So uh, thank you all for joining us, and. Uh, and that will conclude our, uh, our annual meeting. Take care, everyone.